All right. Good evening, everybody. We are with Roberto Rivera. And, it, you know, there's just this little twinkling on my screen so that that logo on your shirt looks like it's dancing. Um, <laughs> that's pretty nice. good. All right. Yeah, I, had so, all, I had it all planned out, Paul. Just yeah. like that. <laughs> all right, man. Um, do you consider yourself an artist? Yes, I do consider myself an artist. What is your medium? Yep. So I'm a I'm a playwright, I'm a poet, I'm an MC, and I'm also a community organizer, which I believe is also an art form uh, to its own respect. So, yeah, a few different mediums. How do you, all right? Let's, do you do you consider yourself a particularly disciplined person? Yes, I do. <laughs> you think that's necessary to be able to break down your week or your days into different components so you can do these different kinds of activities? Well, it, it's interesting because, you know, currently I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a PhD student studying educational psychology. Um, I'm also the co-founder of the Good Life Organization, and we specialize in what we call edutainment combining entertainment and education. Um, and so I have a lot of different things. You know, folks ask me, you know, what's, what's going on? What, what's your life like these days? I'm like, man, I feel like I'm a turntablist on six turntables trying to keep the records going without, you know, stopping the party. So at least initially I had to, you know, be very methodical with my time. But, you know, what I realized, Paul, is that, you know, sometimes whether I'm, you know, cooking up, an idea for a new curriculum or, you know, working on a, a piece of poetry or, you know, getting right, ready to write a paper, that inspiration comes at different times. Um, you know, even when I did the TED Talk, you know, it was like I got bits and pieces of inspiration at different places. And, you know, as I started to document those things and put them down on my phone or a napkin or a scrap of paper, it, 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 kind of feels like it's inspired and, and starts to kind of formulate itself. And, and so for me, you know, I see life as like an art, you know, in that regard. I know that maybe sounds cliche, but, you know, to try to posture myself to be in these places of inspiration and to capture that, that's where my best artwork is created, really. Do you feel like you can create moments where inspiration happen or they just happen or mm -hmm. like, I mean, you know, there's this wonderful quote by Chuck Close that says, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest okay. of us just show up and get to work. You know, <laughs> and many, many artists say, well, I can't do shit because I don't have any inspiration and I'm waiting for it. And a lot of people, you know, just recommend go into the studio, make a mark and, you know, make, make another mark, write a word, you know, make a, make a noise. Um, what do you do? Can you, can you create scenarios whereby inspiration is more likely to occur? You know, it's interesting, Paul, you know, we have these discussions with our youth as we're kind of teaching critical thinking and creative skills, communication, using the arts. So we have a curriculum called Fulfill the Dream that does just that. And so we have these conversations about like, you know, when does poetry really start? Is it, you know, when you uh, write, put your pen to the page? Is it, you know, when you get up on a stage? Is it, you know, when you flow instead of going into a complete rage, right? So, you know, when is poetry or is poetry, you know, a way of living, a way of being, and, you know, a way of seeing the world. And so we kind of get into this critical dialogue and, you know, just trying to get to a place where, you know, we're able to see the ordinary or the extraordinary out of the ordinary, able to see something you know, beautiful out of the mundane. And I think that, you know, getting into that place, for me, it does take some posturing. Um, takes me, you know, practicing being in the moment. I'm less in inspired if I'm worried about tomorrow or thinking about yesterday, you know. Um, so just, you know, my wife is a yoga uh, teacher. And so she's always like, I'm going to go practice yoga. And I think in the, in the same respect, you know, being in the moment, um, being available for inspiration, like yoga, it's a practice, you know? Absolutely. So you feel like the more you enable, there's a different twist here though, it's pretty fascinating to me. You feel like you, it's a muscle or something that can be trained and you can be 
by being perceptive, you can create scenarios whereby inspiration happens more often. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll point to about troubled youths to an extent, but I don't see how that's any different than Picasso. You know, um, right. it, it's about being, I'm an inspirational dude. I'm an inspired dude um, here because I'm inspired all the time. It's not like artists can, see, this is one of the things that I think differentiates artists and bankers, for example. <laughs> Banker, you know, it's five o'clock, the, the bell rang, I'm going home now, you all, see ya. But, you know, if you're an artist, it's sort of like, well, shit, I'm an artist, I'm still an artist. And, you, you know, it's something you continue being. And I encourage artists a lot. I mean, me too. I encourage myself to try to yourself, try and right. be creative. You know, yeah. I mean, like, we shouldn't only be creative with the artwork we make. We should be creative with our lives and, you know, our careers and find creative ways. This is what this course is about in part, is how to, you know, how can we be creative career-wise to move our career along? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I have a few different mediums. Uh, one of them is, you know, being an MC, And so, you know, part of that, and there's a lot of different layers to being an MC, but, you know, it's just practicing the art of freestyle. You know, so I was just in Minnesota and we would get, you know, different topics from the audience. And we uh, did a collaboration with the chamber orchestra and some beatboxers. And we did a freestyle, you know, during this conference and it was beautiful. And I think that, you know, again, in order to really get into that flow, and I'll talk about, you know, flow theory in a second, but, you know, getting into that, that flow where you're, you know, in real time but you know inspired by what's going on around you it, it, to me it, it does take some some practice you know just being in a moment um you know just being aware of of everything that you hear everything that you smell everything that you feel um you know just trying to really be in that moment and you know kind of going back to this notion of flow uh there's this psychologist and i always massacre his name he's a russian guy but if you look up flow theory, you'll find him. And he's got a super long name. But he's got this notion that, you know, we can engage in this, what he calls a zone of proximal development. So if people are too anxious or they're challenged too, too much, then they start getting, you know, worried and concerned and they don't perform at an optimal level. And then, you know, they're not in that zone or that flow. And also there's a lower part to the flow theory where, if you're not challenged enough, if you're bored, then you're not fully engaged. You're not in flow. So flow necessitates, you know, being engaged enough, being pushed enough, but not so much that you're starting to shut down and freak out. And you can start to get into this zone of proximal development where you're, where you're flowing. And we've all been there as artists, you know, where, where hours go by and it feels like a couple of minutes, like, holy crap, I can't believe, you know, it's been a couple hours, it felt like a couple of minutes, you know, and, um, so I think that there is some conditions for that. And also the research says that, you know, being in community and getting that feedback from folks can help us to get into that space as well. And so, you know, as I go back to this idea of MC, the way that we frame that is someone who can master their craft, someone who can move a crowd, and someone who can also make a change. That really the highest level of art is not only just, you know, getting people to say, wow, this artwork is great, but that there's something that is changed in them, changed in the world. And I believe that that comes from what you were talking about earlier and being authentic, letting that change, you know, be um, part of, of your artwork, that the art in many ways, you know, is therapeutic. A lot of folks say, well, you know, Roberto, how would you go, you know, from being this kid who was labeled at risk and LD to getting a PhD? Like, what the heck happened? And, and what was the role of hip hop in that? And I say, well, you know, hip hop in this medium, it was, it was the only therapy we had, you know? Uh, we were able to tell our blue stories. We were able to, you know, connect with this jazz community of folks telling these stories and collectively to realize that, you know, like the gospel notion that we can overcome some of the things that are oppressing us, that are suppressing us, that are holding us back. And so, just a few a few thoughts okay i don't know where to go with all this 
<laughs> well, we're flowing right now, so you know. <laughs> yeah, I was there. Um, how did you get so lucky to figure this out? How did this happen? I mean, you know, I feel like I'm pretty wise, and it took me into my mid late sixties to figure out. And I, and I imagine, you know, I'll be wiser at some point in the future. You know, the, the amount of wisdom you bring into this game already is a little bit scary. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I don't know. I mean, so how did you? How did you? How did you pull off this wisdom in this short period of time? Well, I definitely appreciate that. And, uh, you know, my wife would probably be like, yeah, right. You know, you know he's a wise guy. All right. You know. Yeah. Well, um, wives are important for, to keep <laughs> us, to keep, because they're sharper than we are. That's but, right. Yeah. Um, um, I, you yeah. know, I think, I think it's been a lot of different things. Um, you know, I think a big thing is just realizing the role that hip hop culture has played in my life in terms of a healing, but then also just, the story of hip hop as a whole, I've come to understand is one of the greatest case studies in the history of the world. And what can happen when people who are very creative, you know, um, are lacking the resource, are um, hungry for healing and hungry to be resilient and hungry for change. And unfortunately, this story oftentimes gets convoluted and, and, and gets muted you know, with the master narrative of hip hop industry and all the bling bling and shaking booties. So I, I differentiate the industry and the culture. And so if, if you have more questions on that, we can get to it. But as far as the culture is concerned, you know, as far as, as, far as I have read and, and understood, you know, there's never been any, you know, musical and cultural phenomenon that has permeated the world in quite the same way that hip hop has. You know, I went to the Middle East a couple of years ago and you know i was just taken back by you know the visual art the the aerosol art the graffiti that i saw the people that i was able to connect with you know who didn't speak hardly any english they spoke arabic but because of of hip-hop in this art form we were able to connect in some ways that are even deeper than people i can speak the same language with right it was like this cultural artistic language that connected us and so a lot of my study, you know, as, as we look at engaging young people and helping them to, you know, do positive stuff with their time. And, you know, we have this catchphrase of taking our pain and turning it into propane is realizing that a lot of these lessons and principles are not things that are necessarily outside of us and our culture, but they're embedded in our personal and collective narrative, you know, as being part of, of this hip hop generation. And so, you know, is this whole notion in hip hop around sampling, you know, that a, a good producer uh, will, will go through different records and expose him or herself to different kinds of music, might be jazz, might be, you know, classical, might be Motown, right? And, you know, you're, you're exposing yourself to different music and you're, you're, you're opening up yourself so that that music that may be non-traditional can, can speak to you in a way that's profound, right? But if you just play that piece of music over and over, it gets kind of boring, right? So, the producer would take that piece and make it authentic by remixing it, right? Adding his or her own beat, his or her own spin on that music with the goal of creating a particular sound that's unique to, to that producer, right? And that can move the crowd and at the highest level can inspire another generation of producers. So we take that as a metaphor and we say, well, if producers can sample to create these beats and this, this aesthetic, right? That's, you know, you can hear a Kanye West beat and be like, oh, that's Kanye right there, right? How can we begin to sample consciousness? And that we have people, you know, that we all know who are heroes, who are heroines, you know, there's, there's certain, you know, history that we don't learn in our schools that we, you know, can, can go through the people's history, right? And go through these different records and begin to find these examples of folks who have lived purposefully and remix these examples into our own life with the goal of creating a soundtrack that's artistic and creative so that A, you know, we can add our beat, our, our voice, and B, we can, you know, move the crowd. But C, for me, my goal is, you know, I want some of my youth that I work with to say, man, you know, I'm gonna sample from your example, big bro, you know? And so just kind of taking that metaphor and that, uh, that notion of sampling consciousness you know, I've, I've learned from my grandfather. I've learned from, you know, 
uh, my, my eight-year-old brother who battled with cancer. You know, I've learned from so many people. I think it, it's just a big remix, really. <laughs> so. I'm trying to, all right, wait. I, I, I hear the words. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, when you talk about remix, you're talking about allowing some the influence of the things that you find strong in someone else to permeate you. Yeah, things things that you know are are exemplars of you know living purposefully, you know, or or loving people well. That you know, we it's interesting because we live in a society that really tries to influence us to not be producers, you know, that tries to influence us to be consumers. And just like you know, I was talking about the zone of proximal development. I have my own theory of of zone of proximal consumerism. You know, okay. we're, we're, we're bombarded, you know, with media and advertising every day. And I, and from, you know, my own kind of, you know, reflection and research and me search, you know, I've come to understand that, you know, there's a lot of entities that benefit off of people spending way more money than they can afford. And, you know, if, if folks are in a zone where they're too productive, they're too creative, they're, you know, making their dreams a reality. These people aren't consuming at the highest level and nor are the people who are so utterly depressed and isolated. They're completely shut down. They're not in the zone of consumerism. So if you can get, you know, enough people to get into this place where you have a little bit of brokenness, a little bit of aspiration, but not quite sure how to get there and not quite sure how to meet their needs, then you can get masses of people who are at an optimal level of consumerism. And I think that these are folks who, you know, may not be aware of their needs. They're not aware of how to meet these needs. And we all have needs of living and loving and learning and leaving a legacy, you know? And so what I'm trying to do is trying to figure out how do I meet my needs and how do I meet the needs of my community? And some people embody meeting these needs in an, in an artistic and an amazing way. And yeah, I want a sample from these folks, you know? Okay, okay, okay. So we're talking in front of a group of visual artists, okay? Okay. Painters, sculptors, people who make <laughs> shit we look at, all right? Right. Um, what are they supposed to do? What are they not doing enough of? What should they do more of? How, how should they, how do they benefit? How do they themselves benefit by being more right. present, more grounded, more open-minded, more aware? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 I, I would just kind of share that, that sampling consciousness idea. You know, I have a buddy of mine uh, named Jinx. He's a platinum producing uh, beat maker. He does stuff for, you know, different hip hop groups, R&B. And one of his secrets is that he just exposes himself to vast amounts of music. You know, just stuff that, that most, as you would think, hip hop traditional type guys would not expose themselves to. And as he's exposing himself to different things, he's very sensitive about what, what speaks to him, what moves his soul, right? And so he'll take these different excerpts. It might be a, a Nat King Cole, you know, piece. It might be a classical piece. He may be getting a, a gyro, you know, down in Greektown, and he hears some ding a ding a ding a ding and he's like, oh, man. And, and so he's living in the moment enough where he's able to capture that piece and then use it later on to remix it, to make it his own. So I would say, you know, that is transferable for any kind of art. You know, expose yourself to different things that are deemed non-traditional. You know, try to be in the moment. Try to be um, in tune with yourself and see what is speaking to you. And, you know, don't think of it as being, you know, a copycat or a mimic, but see if you can remix, you know, that piece that is speaking to you. See what... What is it about that piece that you enjoy so much? And make it your own, you know, remix it, add your own voice, put your own spin to it. Maybe, it, you know, if someone has something that they've done with some kind of fabric, you know, maybe you can use a different medium to create something in a similar fashion that, you know, has your own spin on it. So I think that's the other thing with hip hop is that, you know, you have uh, these folks who, who, who were artists, right? But the public schools at the time didn't have arts classes. They didn't have music classes because they didn't have the funding due to all the, 
the burning of buildings. And now I'm kind of getting into the history of the South Bronx in the 60s. But um, these kids are artists. So how do they get this art out? Well, they take what they have available to them. You know, it might not be a paintbrush. It's this aerosol can, right? And they, they, they take that and they say, this is my paintbrush. That decrepit building over there, that's my canvas, you know? And it, it, it revolutionizes this whole aesthetic. They take the appliance. You got to remember the turntable back in the day was like a blender or a toaster. If you told people that you're going to go home and play on the turntable, you're like, well, you could, that's like saying you're going to go play with your four-speed blender when you get home. Oh, yeah, man, I'm about to make some music on this blender. <laughs> like, dude, you're crazy. But these guys, you know, took these two turntables, took two copies of the same record, and now if you go into Guitar Center or Word Brought, everybody's like, yeah, next to the viola and the cello and the piano is the turntables because that's an instrument, duh. Well, it wasn't always that case. So how can we be resourceful with what it is that we have and incorporate that into this art that we're creating? Is there is there a balance or is there a danger, the line between knowing who I am and my aesthetic and sampling something external and losing myself and my authenticity? You know, I think, uh, again, authenticity is a practice. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it goes down to, you know, everything from – our choices and what we're going to drink that day, how we're going to spend our time. Um, you know, are, are we, are we trying to, you know, let society mold us or pressure us into doing certain things? Are we living from this, this space that's authentic, that's spiritual oftentimes. Right. And so, you know, I really think that, um, you know, just like bringing it back to hip hop, you know, you'll have people who will do different records and, you know, some records may have 10 or 20 tracks. You know, I think that from my own practice, it's helped me to realize, okay, if I want to, if I want to, you know, write a certain kind of music, I don't have to do that music forever, right? I can do an album, you know what I mean? And then that gospel album is out of the way. If I want to do a blues album or something with some reggae remix, you know, I can, I can do a series of things. And if something continues to speak to me, and I need to, you know, do a double album or so forth, you know, then, then I need to stick with that. You know what I mean? I, I think that um, it's a practice. I think that sometimes there's, there's dimensions of who we are that society doesn't want us to explore. Uh, you know, I think, I think society teaches us to be afraid of our power. <laughs> you know what I mean? If, if you're powerful and you're, you're igniting other people to meet their needs in creative ways and not to be this consumer, but to be this producer, then you're, you're taking the red pill. You're, you're unplugging from the matrix and you know, that's counterculture living. So I think we need these kinds of spaces to live counterculturally, to, to see with that poetic lens, to, you know, have permission to be authentic, to be powerful, to live out of the box, to expose ourselves to different things. And so, you know, again, it's, it's an honor to be here and to just kind of share my heart tonight. What do you do? What do you do when you're working with these kids who don't feel, I mean, you and I both know and work with a lot of TED fellows and mm -hmm. we've observed that they like normal humans have insecurities and you're working with underprivileged, under, underserved kids. And a lot of them have the, a, a, a bigger right to feel like nobody's listening. Right. Um, and that, that they're not, their voice isn't going to be appreciated. How, how do you get people who don't feel that they have a right to be heard or don't have, or people don't have a desire to hear them to speak? Yeah, I mean, this, this is a whole other art form right here. Um, I, I'll share a couple of pieces. So one, you know, is just kind of um, reflecting on the story of Michelangelo, right? So the great, you know, uh, Renaissance man, Sistine Chapel, you know, Statue of David, right? Um, not the one that eats pizza and says cowabunga with the other half-shell guys. But <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. Maybe you didn't catch it. Somebody did. Uh, <laughs> Um, so as the story goes, you know, he was trying to teach 
some young people and how to do some sculpting themselves. And so I guess he's a very project-based kind of teacher, uh, pedagogue, if you will. So he gives these guys a stone, right? And they're in this great hall with all these statues. And so for like this long period of time, they're like trying to make something beautiful out of this stone. And they get so frustrated at the end of the day, Paul, that they, you know, throw their tools down. They come over to Michelangelo and they say, hey, Mike, man, how, how you make something so beautiful out of something so ugly? How do you make something so priceless out of something so worthless? I'm kind of giving you my rendition of what went down. But his response is remarkable in that he says, you know, I'm not really creating anything. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, see, you have to have a relationship with the stone. And eventually that stone will reveal the beautiful sculpture that's within it. Then he says, my job is easy. I just seek to chip away at the rough pieces that have trapped the sculpture, right? And so, you know, relating that to education, the root word for education comes from the Latin term educare, which means to bring out that which is already there. So as it pertains to your question and these young people who are labeled at risk, you know, we get invited to come speak to the worst kids in the district in Chicago or, you know, in LA is like, these are the biggest knuckleheads in the district. So that's the challenge for us to come in with that Michelangelo vision to not see what society and all the people in power seeing these young people as these stones, how can we begin to see that sculpture and build that relationship? Because really education is twofold. One is seeing the beauty and brilliance in youth, and then two is creating an experience where they can see that and experience that for themselves. And so when we're working with youth, we're not asking what is wrong with you, we're asking what is right with you, and trying to find those assets and trying to find those strengths because I believe this with all my heart and this is kind of part of my own story is that, you know, the kids who are labeled at risk are really the kids who, you know, are pissed off enough, who have gifts that have been overlooked, who have amazing potential that if rerouted in the right way could create a lot of, a lot of good in the world. They could be some of the greatest artists, the greatest architects, the greatest innovators, the greatest iterators of new forms of democracy. And so, when young people can tell both verbally and non-verbally that this is how I see you as a beautiful sculpture, as part of the solution and not part of the problem, they start to respond to that. You know what I mean? It's like a plant that's been deprived of light and water and you start giving this thing light and water, it's gonna start to grow. And it's a, it's a reciprocally transformative experience. So it's not just that we're liberating the youth, they take an active role in their liberation, as well as the liberation of us who are continuing in that practice of trying to be free, you know? She said that's a direct parable, parable for what goes on in this course with all these visual artists. And, you know, I mean, to some extent, I'm showing them how the art world works, but to another extent, they get permission to feel comfortable with their own voice and that's why I'm, you know, you, you and I are talking early in this series of webinars that we'll be doing, because I think you do a really good job of, you know, setting the stage for people being who they are and honoring their distinctiveness and, you know, what distinguishes them from all others. We haven't really touched on that. But, I mean, do you talk to these kids about be who you are and don't try and be like him or her because that person's already taken? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a big part of it is just getting young people to think critically. You know, they're, they're taking in a lot of media and consuming a lot without thinking about it. And our education system, you know, with all the pressures from No Child Left Behind and teaching for the test, really inhibits young people from being these critical thinkers and being very creative, which they are. And so, you know, just trying to expose them to different things, and we use quotes and we use video clips as they're thinking critically about who they are, what's important to them, what their dreams are, then they start to realize, well, man, you know, I don't want to go down this route because that would not be fulfilling my dream. That'd be fulfilling a fantasy, right? And I'd be exalting my wants over my needs, and that's not going to lead me to fulfillment. So helping them to think critically, um, getting them to just start sharing, you know, parts of their story and to realize that, you know, and I use this phrase a lot, but the, that our pain can be converted into propane. 
that can fuel our personal transformation as well as the transformation of the world. But oftentimes we can't make that full conversion from pain to propane on our own. We need community. We need other folks who are willing to be open and vulnerable. And, you know, art is a great vehicle to express our emotions, to have dialogue, you know, to not only paint the way that things are, but to envision the way that things could be, to cultivate that radical imagination, you know? And so as they start sharing these stories and poems and visual art, uh, I have a copy here of, of a book that some of our youth put together, you know, some of the best, uh, you know, photography, a lot of it is poetry and rap, different murals, um, you know, just young people expressing themselves, you know what I mean? And as they're doing that, you know, they realize that they're not alone, that a lot of these things that they're thinking about, a lot of these things that they're battling with, that other people in other cities around the nation. So there's seven different cities that are represented in the book. I don't know if I gave you a copy of this, Paul. I got the app. Yeah, so then eventually they turned it into an app. And, you know, just trying to create a platform for voices. And I think that, you know, that's the beautiful thing about your work, Paul and, and, and Lisa and others who are part of your network is that you're creating these platforms for these voices. Without the platforms, it's hard for these voices to really have, you know, much to aspire to or to realize, hey, you know, there's other people who are thinking along these lines. And so, you know, whether it be a gallery, whether it be a book, whether it be an app, we have open mics. We also do these things called open ciphers. Just getting together and sharing, man, it, it can be very powerful and very transformative. So the platform Let's take some questions. Um, yeah. Sarah Louise, your hand has been up so long, I, I imagine you forgot what you wanted to say. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, I have forgotten what I was, I don't know what I was going to say. Um, Roberto, you have just been amazing. It's been absolutely wonderful listening to you. You're so filled with um, compassion and such wisdom and such a spiritual drive. Um, you're just an amazing guy. So I think we're all, we've been talking to each other about you off in the chat box through the whole of your um, interview. Um, I really don't know what I was going to ask, but I'm glad I got a chance to talk to you. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing your heart as well. <laughs> um, Jeannie, hi there. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I have a question um, for you because um, um, I'm a realistic art painter and uh, well, you're talking about authenticity uh, yes. and how um, can you be authentic when you are making realistic portraits, for, for example? Can you say something about that? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. You know, I'm not, I don't do portraits, so I can't necessarily speak to that medium. But, um, you know, I can tell you about an uh, um, album that I did called The First Fruits. And, uh, you know, doing this particular album, to me, it was, it was very realistic about, you know, where I currently was and, and, and where I was hoping to be. And so... I was going through this very, very difficult time in my life um, where, you know, I had moved to a new city. I didn't know many people. Um, I was going through a divorce in terms of business partnerships. So a partner of mine um, just went crazy. And so we had to split up the whole business and, and end a lot of really beautiful work. And so for me, I realized that sometimes as an MC or as a, or as a rapper using that medium, you know, I get so wrapped up in the response, you know what I mean? That, that I'm anticipating what, what, what the audience is going to think, you know what I mean? And, and, and to me that can get us into a place of, of performance. That's very fear driven. That's, you know, um, you're so, you're so focused on moving the crowd that you're not being authentic to who you are. So for me, it, it required me to um, be creative with the creator that uh, I made, a, I made a, a pact in the beginning of doing this album that I didn't care what 
anybody else was going to think. But I was going to try to move the heart of the creator. And so I'm a spiritual guy. I believe there's a creator. And I, I believe that the whole universe was created in poetry. And it was a very artistic expression. And so my goal was to move the heart of the creator to uh, be honest about where I was, what I was struggling with, what I was pissed off about, and, and, and where I wanted to be. And so a lot of inspiration during that time, you know, came from, from the prophet, you know, David, you know, the psalmist. The, the here, here is a, a collection of artwork that we have, you know, from this cat. And I relate to him because doing some research, I found out that a majority of the psalms were done freestyle, impromptu, that he had, you know, uh, folks who were scribes that would capture this in-the-moment inspiration. Um, David was not only the MC, but he was also a DJ, and that he created over 200 instruments that never existed before, right? And so, you know, we don't have all the details of his life, but we do know that he created a majority of the psalms, which, you know, in one instance, he's you know, in worship, and the next instance, he's pissed off, you know what I mean? And so I think being real about where we're at, what we're hoping to be, and not being so caught up in what other people will think, but if we can move that creator, if we can move that higher consciousness, if you will, to me, that's where I've experienced the greatest authenticity. So I hope that helps you. Oh, great, thank you. And how, what what are you doing to to be in that kind of flow? What are are you eating differently, or uh, do you meditate, or what what do you do? Uh, so I do different things. Um, I I I I fast, so which can take different forms in terms of like you know eating, trying to eat more cleanly, for example, or or just taking a fast from you know, not just eating, you know, fast food and junk food, but just being more aware of what I'm consuming visually or with music. Um, you know, just trying to trying to eat healthily because we, you know, we are what we eat and we can also consume through what we let in, in our ears and our eyes, you know, and so um, trying to be healthy that way as well helps. And then just being around good people like Paul and, you know, I, I have a very, a very close inner circle. And these are people that I can be completely open with and that we can create and co-create together. So, for example, you know, there's a few brothers that I'm close to. And this weekend we're doing a big show with DMC from Run DMC. And we're bringing in break dancers and MCs. And, you know, we're, we're doing it specifically in the city of Madison, Wisconsin, which was just named the worst place to live for young men of color. And so being able to co-create with other people That is amazing too. So I hope that helps. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Jeannie and Sarah Louise are both from Australia. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Um, and, uh, you know, and here we go. This is a trifecta. And Michael, Michael isn't even from the United States, but he's, he could fake it. Hi, Michael. Yo, brothers, what's happening? What's up, man? <laughs> Michael's in Canada. Thanks uh, for talking, Roberto. I'm uh, interested in you. I have a 16-year-old son who's into Juicy J, Snoop Dogg, right. ASAP Rocky, the whole ASAP crew. He's a six-foot-two, 16-year-old white boy from Vancouver. So nice. I, I keep thinking the pure culture he listens to are all about smoking pot, derogatory comments to women, objectification, all these issues that I discuss with him. And he's like, yeah, Dad, but... I feel powerful when I listen to my shit. Leave me alone. I'm like, oh. So I'm I, I, I kind of curious what your take is on uh, peer culture versus uh, uh, elder culture, if that makes any sense. You're, you're working with a guy from Run DMC. That's pretty cool. That's elder culture right there for me. Uh, anyway. so right. Just curious what your take is on what the kids, the kids listen to in terms of They, a lot of the stuff to me seems like it's coping music. It's not really empowering music. It's it's empowering in an ego and objectification and possessive sense, but not in a empowering in a critical thinking, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uplifting communal sense. So what you're doing to me, I really like. So I'm curious what your your thoughts about the mainstream, the culture that most of the kids in America get is the hip hop 
even the white boys, my whole neighborhood, most is like 80% white. Uh, but they're getting a lot of trash. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I think this might be a good opportunity for me to make a distinction between hip hop culture and hip hop industry. So yeah. the culture uh, started, you know, Seneca in 1971. If there's a motto, it's about get free or die trying. Yeah. Right. So we define it as the modern day phenomenon of oppressed people finding liberation through creative and spiritual means. Right. Yeah. It's about seeing yourself as a producer, as, um, you know, being able to have a voice that can not only edify yourself, but also build up your community. So in uh, contradiction or in contrast to that, the industry starts way later, like Seneca 1991 instead of get free or die trying, it's more centered on get rich or die trying, right? Yeah. Instead of empowering folks, you have the industry trying to have power over people, trying to dictate you know, how to live, how, what to wear, what to do, uh, yeah. to not be a producer, but to be a consumer, right? Yeah. And to, to uplift yourself at the expense of everyone else, even if it is detrimental to your family or your community. Ultimately, what the culture um, has that the industry doesn't is what I call, you know, what we call the knowledge of hip hop, which is in essence, the art of survival. So hip hop is a baby that has umbilical cords to the tradition of, of the blues, of the gospel, of the jazz impulse. So the blues, and, and this is trans, you know, transcends even just this genre is found in, in, in rock and roll that we all love. It's found in country music for folks who are in the country. I don't know what they listen to Australia. They might have their own kind of bluegrass thing. I don't know. But, you know, the music that really is timeless is the music that has these different impulses. So the blues, for example, you're, you're dealing with the brutal experience or something that hurts you. And instead of suppressing that and, and, and putting that down and ignoring it, you're making the decision to turn it into art. It might be poetry. It might be visual art, realism. It might be um, literature, right? And so in doing that, you're also having what uh, Ralph Ellison calls a near tragic, near comic lyricism, right? So you're, you're laughing to keep from crying. And as you're creating this kind of art form, you're uh, reaffirming yourself and your ability to continue on. So gospel in a similar vein says, okay, I have this brutal experience, but instead of just putting this into art, I'm going to try to connect with something greater than myself. I'm going to try to connect with my community. I'm going to try to connect with my creator. And whereas the blue says, I'm going to make it through another day, gospel says we can actually find redemption. So the things that are holding us back, we can actually change these things. So look, you know, thinking of like civil rights, for example, they changed a lot of these realities, especially if, as it pertains to policy, you know. So as we turned young people on to these different lenses for thinking critically about the music that they're consuming and, and understanding how it can help them in their reality, it's like taking young people who have been eating, you know, McDonald's every day and yeah. you start exposing them to good, healthy, organic farmer's market food, right? They start all of a sudden developing this palate and this taste for something that's a little more healthy, that is actually a little bit more fulfilling, you know, and it, and it doesn't happen overnight. And the interesting thing is when we get to a place where young people, they start self-selecting saying, man, I don't want to listen to Lil Wayne and Drake and then, man, they just on some fantasy music. I'm hungry for some reality music. And that takes a little bit more digging, it takes yeah. a little bit more, you know, getting in and seeing what's out there. But who, once who, do you, who do you recommend? Who do, you that, who do you recommend that, I listen to to put on for my son? Yeah, once that fire gets lit, it, it's just like, get out of the way. So, I mean, you know, you, you're welcome to follow up with me. But, um, yeah. you know, uh, just a few people that I'm listening to, like Lupe Fiasco, uh, yeah. Talib Kweli. Um, you know, there's a local artist who was just uh, written up in Chicago who's a good friend of mine. He's tremendous. His name is Phnom. Um, yeah. You know, and, and in the words of Talib Kweli, man, you know, a lot of artists come to tell you the way that things are. He says, we come to tell you not only how things are, but how things could be, you know. And I think that's so powerful. Nice. I hope, I hope that answers your question a little bit. That's good, yeah.
Okay. That was fun. All right. Thank you. Um, oh, and Jenny pointed out that she's from the Netherlands and not Australia. <laughs> now, I was only like 15, 20,000 miles off. <laughs> <laughs> Get it right, Paul. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right, Meredy, um, go ahead. Yes, first of all, thank you so much. You, you hit on, you touched on so many things that I deeply believe in that I think are necessary and that just aren't going away. And uh, I wanted to ask if you had heard of the David Lynch Foundation. They, uh, they, he goes in and works with at-risk kids. Mm. You know, it sounds familiar, but I haven't, I, uh, looks like I need to explore that a little further. David Lynch Foundation. Remind me, where are they again? Uh, well, they're, they, they go into at-risk um, uh, arenas and they, and they teach kids how to meditate. And then out of mm -hmm. that comes, their, their, their minds get settled down enough so that they can then receive and start thinking critically and make better decisions. And that's the whole premise of it. And they not only have uh, the principal and the teachers and the kids, they all do it. It's, it's not just like, okay, kids, we're going to have you shut your eyes now for 10 minutes. <laughs> they all do it and they all affect each other. It's very powerful, very powerful. And uh, he's a filmmaker and so it's, you know, it's quite a, a impressive uh, documentation that's going on. Anyway, I thought you might like to know about that. One thing I wanted to ask is, um, uh, that I'm always curious about is okay. So you're first of all, you must be a young man in a hurry because you have covered a lot of ground. And I'm wondering if you have any, um, uh, you know, your antenna up for where the youth of uh, the future is going or headed to. You know what what the next. Um, uh, taste level might be, you know, because things have really come together in all the arts, you know, they've, they've merged and uh, every time you turn around, there's uh, two different kinds of music being put together or two different kinds of dance forms or music and dance forms and painting and video. And uh, I just wondered if you had any um, instinctual uh, hints or uh, preferences for how you saw the youth um, progressing with their art forms? It's a good question. Um, it's a big question. I'll try to address it a little bit and I'll have to think about it more. But, you know, we're, we're moving at an unprecedented rate, you know, out of the industrial age into this knowledge innovation age. And, you know, it's a major shift. Still, a lot of our schools and a lot of our systems are operating in this industrial, you know, mindset. And, you know, <laughs> which is difficult for folks like me who, you know, in order to speak to the current paradigm and, and get things going in public schools, I have to speak to that mindset while still keeping a foot towards where things need to go, you know. Mm -hmm. But the shift that I see happening in my work is uh, moving from this innovation to a transformation, uh, transformational space. And so, what, what that looks like for us is just realizing that, you know, young people um, have tremendous energy, they have tremendous creativity, and they need that mentorship. They need that experience, that wisdom, that support from elders. The research says that, you know, young people, part of them thriving is having that relationship with someone other than a parent, you know, an adult that can support them. And as far as like these youth serving organizations, we believe that no youth serving organization will ever reach its full potential without the consistent input of youth. And so I think as far as education, and I believe this is the case in a lot of other spheres, um, is that, you know, the folks that, that uh, we're trying to serve, they need to have a voice in how to best meet their needs and, and how to best utilize these spaces that we're creating. And so I think we're going to see a shift where, you know, different school boards, um, different boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, will start having more young people in this place of power and authority to give them insight in how to meet these needs. I think that there's a real hunger for, for some change. And I think that as folks start to experience that, you know, looking at 
not only just civil rights and apartheid and Brazil and the role that young people have played in, in creating that transformation, but even in Egypt, uh, you know, uh, what's going on in Hong Kong, right? These different spaces, young people have been a part of every social movement in the last 50 years. And I think that we're getting to a point where we need that, that real time input and real time partnership and so what I think that's going to also mean is that we're going to be co-creating, using technology to co-create different art forms, different educational curricula, things like that, you know, understanding that we're, we're, we're connected globally. I mean, if you check me out on SoundCloud, I have, you know, some collaborations I've done with folks in the UK and Uganda and the Middle East. And, you know, these are kind of my just side passion projects. But I see that kind of collective wisdom and co-creation really being important on a lot of levels. So that's, uh, that's all I got for you right now. I'll keep thinking about it. Though. That's pretty good. I asked um, a young skateboard artist who uh, has some uh, attention, some fame, um, where he thought it was going. And so your answer is basically more collaboration. His answer was maybe uh, lack of ownership which is similar, you know, in other words, it wasn't so much me, my painting, my music, my this, my that, but how, how, how it feeds into the community at large. And I think visual artists are up against it too, depending on, um, you know, how isolated they are. Uh, they need to collaborate and come up with some new ideas to where, where to show the work, how to make it important in the community. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. That was interesting. All right, uh, maybe two more questions. Kathleen, go ahead. Hi, Roberto, how are you? Hi, Kathleen. Um, I just want to tell you, I'm a special ed teacher for the past 20 years. Okay. And I just love your story. Thanks. And I can't wait to tell my kids tomorrow. So I, I'm so happy you included the at risk and the LD. I yep. think that's great because some of my students are struggling so they don't do well in classes, but they have so much potential. So yeah. they can go anywhere they want. So thanks. Yeah, and, and, and just, you know, uh, I think I just want to share, too, that, you know, I've done conferences with kids who are labeled, you know, talented and gifted and kids who are all special ed. Give me the special ed kids, you know, oh, any well, day of the week. They're yeah, way more yeah. creative, way more collaborative, way more out of the box, way more passionate. I've actually stopped doing events for gifted and talented groups just because <laughs> it's so boring. I just, I hate it. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, I just say, you know, hey, I was LD, but I realized that I wasn't learning disabled. I just learned differently, right? So they have that, that gift and that spark and that passion. And they need people like you to find it and to help fan it into a flame. So keep up the good work. And that's what I try to tell my kids. LD doesn't mean anything. It means you right. learn differently. That's, that's, that's good. So thanks. Thank you. thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. That's really cool. Um, June, you are unmuted. Go ahead, June. Hi, Roberto. Um, I too am an educator. I'm an art educator and I'm just nice. so proud of you and inspired mm -hmm. by you and have learned so much from you. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to your website and looked at some of the videos there and so was able to witness, you know, look at the actual work that you were doing and it's just inspiring and beautiful. Um, and that's it. Oh, well, thank you. And, and, and keep, keep doing your authentic thing. And, you know, being an educator is an art and a science. So I hope you can keep both of those fires burning. Nice to meet you. Sure will. Nice to meet you as well. You going to be in LA anytime soon? Los uh, Angeles? I don't have anything on the calendar, but I love going to LA, especially in the winter time. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we have, uh, we've done some work out there in the past and I assume I'll come back out there one of these days. So I look forward yeah, to it. Shoot me an email. Shoot me an email. We'll we'll stay in contact. I will. All okay. Right. Sounds good. Thanks. All right, you guys are quick. We'll do a couple more. Um, Robin. Hi, Robin. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, Roberto. Thank you so much. This is Thank you, Robin. Leaving me full here. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you have so much. Um, first of all, you know, you in your TED talk, you were talking about bringing people together and really 
you know, uh, bringing youth empowerment organizations together and kind of creating a, a voice, a common voice, a common mission. So I'm curious how you see that coming together. And then I wanted to tell you that my brother-in-law, um, Daryl Thompson, is the executive director of Boulder Options in Minneapolis. And um, <laughs> I sent him your TED Talk last night. And it's all about, you know, um, mentoring and leadership and they use athletics and um, all kinds of community involvement. And he typed back a couple lines. He said, I love Roberto. I've got to find him. So, <laughs> so he'll be in contact, I'm sure. Yeah, I think he, uh, he already reached out to me via LinkedIn. So I was oh, like, right. I was like, Bo I was like Boulder because we've done a bunch of stuff in Boulder, Colorado. I'm like, no, this is Boulder, like Boulder options. I'm like, oh, okay. So Great. Yeah, that's funny. He's already responded. Great. And uh, was there a question or just? Yeah, how do you see this all coming together? Do you see a common voice? Do you see multiple organizations coming together and um, kind of doing it their own way, but sharing a mission? You know, what do you envision here with this bringing everybody together? Well, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, if we really want to get to the root of a lot of what's happening, we have to kind of move out of this mindset that we can do it all by ourselves, you know? And it's this whole idea that young people and all people really for that matter, you know, we don't grow up in programs, we don't grow up in organizations, we grow up in community, you know? And that if we want young people or anybody, you know, it's not, not just youth development, but human development to reach their full potential, then we have to act like a community, you know? Which means that we have to talk to one another, that, the school district needs to talk to the Boys and Girls Club and the Y and, and that the artists, you know, are, are part of this community and part of this network, right? And so part of what I'm doing with the dissertation and the research is just to say, you know, these artists are some of our greatest assets in the community that are not being tapped for their full potential and their ability, as some of you already embody this, to be these artists educators, to be... Um, these folks who are modeling a different way of being, of being creative, being a producer instead of a consumer, living out of the box. Um, a, lot of, a lot of young folks just need to be exposed to folks who are doing things differently. Um, just speaking with an educator in the city of Milwaukee who retired, he educated youth for over 25 years. He was just telling me, you know, a big part of what I would do the first few days is just build relationships with kids. And I'd always ask them, you know, raise your hand if you know five adults who are living their dream. And he said, no one, you know, would raise their hand. What about four, three, two, one? And he said, over the years, he's like, I can probably count on, on one, maybe two hands, the amount of youth who raised their hand that know an actual adult who's living their dream. And that was just so profound for me because the curriculum we develop is called Fulfill the Dream. And so the thought is like, how in the world are we gonna teach kids that they can fulfill their dreams if we as adults, <laughs> aren't living our dreams. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of artists who are, you know, have redefined what it means to live that dream that, you know, can embody and model a different way of being that young people could benefit from. So um, I think working together, realizing that our goal is not just cash, you know, is not just making cash, but making change, right? And, um, and you know, collectively that we can leave a legacy that we couldn't otherwise do on our own. You know, I think, I think these are, there's some ingredients on the table and I think, you know, there's some opportunity for us to cook up a beautiful legacy together. So thank you for the question and I'll consider, you know, still consider and be thinking about that even after this webinar. So thanks. Exciting. Thank you. I think that's a good place to stop. The good people with good questions, but Roberto just summed up something really beautifully and I think we should pause at that moment. Um, do you owe me coffee or do I owe you coffee? <laughs> I think you might owe me a coffee. My turn? Mm -hmm. We'll have to talk about that shit. Or maybe I, I owe you a coffee. No, I, actually, I owe you a coffee. You're right. I, I, think, I think that's right. <laughs> um, we could do that. Um, all right, so this has been really, really wonderful. I don't think I've – I mean, I've done a couple of hundred different webinars, and I haven't seen as many comments – I mean, initially it was just because you were cute, but then the comments started dealing with substance. Um, 
And we appreciate that. <laughs> and you know, it's people really appreciate you, and they really get a sense quickly of you know the substance, to, substantive person you are, and the substantive change you are making. Um, you know, there are some things you said that I will rip off. This has been really good. Hey, we um, just call it we call it sampling. It is sampling. Well, that's it, sampling. That's right. That's a yeah, wrong cultural term there, Paul. Let me unmute everybody so that we can all thank you. Everybody's unmuted. Roberta, you've been awesome, as I hope. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you. All right, everybody. I will see you in a week. Roberta, we'll be in touch. Thank you all.